Abbott. Members, in accordance with the determination of the Business Committee, I call on the Honourable David Cunliffe to make his valedictory statement. The Honourable David Cunliffe. Te Papa Pounamu, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Karanga, karanga, karanga. Na tupuna, haere, haere, haere. Te kahui oro, te koroi o tene whare. E tu, e tu. Tūtahi tonu. Kia koutou o ko hoa mahi ki te kawanatanga. Noho mai, noho mai, noho mai. Ki a tau te rangi marie, ki a tato kato, ka ao, ka ao, ka ao tea. Mr. Speaker, they say that giving a valedictory speech is a bit like being buried alive. It is intended to be permanent. It is usually followed by a wake and you get to witness the eulogies. <laughs> Having failed miserably to obey Holyoke's advice to breathe through my nose on my way in here, his advice may be more useful on the way out. May I thank colleagues from all sides uh, who have joined us today. Yes, I really am going. <laughs> and to all of the friends and family who have joined us from New Lynn, and all around New Zealand. It is profoundly moving to have you all here. Thank you so very much for attending. Mr. Speaker, I think our early lives frame why we're all here. And my parents were from a politically mixed marriage. For years, they actually canceled each other out at the polling booth and probably should have saved the petrol. My father, the Reverend Bill Cunliffe, the Red Reverend, was the son of railway workers and miners. He was the first in his family to go to university. Priests, poets, and politicians, the Cunliffs were always idealists. My mother's family were national voting farming folk. They just got stuff done. My mother was one of four feisty daughters and ahead of her time. She nursed around the world for a decade, starting in post-war Africa. But despite my mother's pleas to avoid politics at the breakfast table, sir, ours was never a household short of opinions, still isn't, as I look to my sons, or as an Anglican vicarage, was never short of opportunities to meet and help the needy. As a kid, I helped my dad with Labour Party chook raffles at the Pleasant Point pub because he was chairman of the Point branch and on Sir Basil Arthur's LEC. I was also caned in the third form for biffing a mate who called me a labour poof. <laughs> so I learned some of my politics by osmosis and some by more direct means. My childhood in small town rural New Zealand was both idyllic and formative. From Te Aroha to Tikuiti to Pleasant Point, afternoons were spent fishing, weekends playing rugby and holidays, farm labouring or rousing in a shearing gang. Those are things you can definitely find on my CV. <laughs> Politics, they say, is like malaria. Once it's in your bloodstream, it's really hard to get rid of. And I really caught the bug as a foreign service officer of tramping Capitol Hill in Washington for the New Zealand Embassy. But it wasn't until I got back in New Zealand that I got to indulge it. And in 1999, thanks to an amazing Titarangi campaign team, we turned a national-held marginal into a safe Labour seat. The campaign theme was so simple I can still remember it. Cops, docks, trees, jobs and kids. Not a bad line if we're stuck for one in 2017. About that time, I featured on a Young Labour fundraising calendar as a gladiator. Go figure. Marion Hobbs was a nun. <laughs> on a motorbike and Trevor and Steve were the Blues Brothers because they were cool. <laughs> it was a while ago. But in any case, picture the class of 99 washing into Parliament with huge energy. 
We staged actually a backbench revolt in FEC to hold up the demutualisation of the New Zealand Stock Exchange, preventing a hostile takeover by the ASX and demanding a proper regulatory framework that may have been good for economic sovereignty, but we got our ears boxed for our enthusiasm. Likewise, chairing the Commerce Committee in my first term, we didn't sugarcoat too many pills after nine long years of opposition. But I must have mellowed with age because the Regulations Review Committee, which I chaired this term, has never put anything to the vote, and I thank members on both sides of that committee for their collegiality and professionalism. 1999-2000 saw business pushback against the Clark government's reforms. It was countered with our very own smoked salmon offensive of canapé and conversation. My small part in that was tragically outed when I erroneously emailed a plan to Jenny Shipley's office. When it turned up on the six o'clock news, it took precisely two seconds for Prime Minister Helen Clark to ring me and share her views on the story with me. You know what I mean. Yes, Helen. <laughs> Jonathan Hunt gave me two excellent pieces of advice that first term that stuck. Never forget you're only here because you have Labour next to your name. And knock every door in your electorate in your first term, because once your constituents know that you're there for them, they will forgive you later time in Wellington. And I have loved being a local MP. To the good people of New Lynn, thank you for letting me represent you. I hope I've done the job justice. But MPs come to Parliament not only to serve their district, but also to contest ideas and policies. We're lucky that we have this institution, that we have the media to cover it, and that we have healthy debate. And since I first walked into this place, my political values have been grounded in a very simple belief that all people are created equal and that therefore they all deserve equal opportunity, dignity and respect. That markets make good servants but bad masters and that it is the government's job to ensure that the economy serves our people and not the other way around. But in a small country, we're all in it together. If we don't educate all our young, who's going to pay for the superannuation and health care of tomorrow? If all our people don't have warm, dry homes, some of our kids will get sick and cannot learn. And if all people don't have jobs that pay a living wage, we will all be the poorer for it. Those are principles that we worked hard to deliver on in the fifth Labour government, and the next Labour government will too. I was fortunate to cut my teeth in the beehive with Sir Michael Cullen, surely one of New Zealand's greatest finances, finance ministers and under the leadership of Helen Clark. I've always thought to work with one of them would have been lucky. To work with a team of two was extraordinary. But it didn't take me long to work out that the real job of an associate minister is photocopying which is shorthand for anything else that senior ministers either don't have the time or the inclination to do. So I got to ask state-owned enterprises why they weren't writing bigger cheques to the Minister of Finance, and to ask the IRD why the child support system pleased absolutely nobody. A highlight was making sandwiches with Trevor Mallard for that modern miracle, the state sector budget round, which Michael Cullen described uh, the fiscal balance as the difference between two very large numbers that bounce around a lot. Grant's smiling, he knows. But balance them he did, with nine straight surpluses and KiwiSaver and the New Zealand superannuation fund to boot. They have stood the test of time and I believe that they are crying out to be built upon. In ICT I watched the Honourable Paul Swain get sliced and diced by the then Monopoly Telecom after the 2001 Fletcher inquiry called time on that neoliberal version of the Emperor's New Clothes known as self-regulation. Sounds a bit like self-flagellation, but less useful. When after the 2005 election, Helen Clark asked me to take on the ICT portfolio, we started a broad-based stock take review immediately 
and after six months of research, there was a compelling business case for pro-competitive regulation. Because of the sensitivity of the issue, we placed high security around all of the paperwork. But that didn't stop a beehive messenger slipping a copy of the Cabinet Committee papers to someone from Telecom at a cycle club meeting. The resulting protest from Telecom was, however, too late. Cabinet had already approved the far-reaching package that unbundled and operationally separated Telecom and overhauled the regulator. Taking legal advice, we released the package that very day, and despite the short-term impact on share prices generated by the loss of monopoly rents, as predicted, investment in the sector doubled, retail prices fell, and broadband rollout took off. The current government has continued that work and good on them. New Zealand is now amongst one of the best-served telecommunications markets in the world, and Kiwis really did get faster, cheaper broadband. As Immigration Minister, my focus was on protecting human rights and getting the skills we needed to move New Zealand forward. I learned pretty quickly that moderate, skill-driven immigration helps build a modern, connected New Zealand. But too many people, too quickly, puts undue pressure on infrastructure and communities, all in the name of grabbing more GDP. No prizes for guessing which zone we are in now. Inheriting the health portfolio a year before a general election was bound to be fun. In my first week, senior doctors were about to go on strike. The headlines screamed system failure. The strike was averted after a long liquid dinner in my beehive office with the DHB and senior doctors' uh, representatives. The only condition was no one was allowed to leave until the deal was signed, which was actually at 5.30 a.m. the next morning. <coughs> Building on the work of previous ministers, we accelerated universal bowel cancer screening, something that still hasn't happened, integrated service planning for cardiology, health IT, and other specialties. We boosted mental health funding, which still needs doing, and kept a strong focus on public health. I still believe that the, there is huge benefit in a free or low-cost, world-class health system that is nationally integrated and reaches right into communities. Going into opposition in 2008 was a shock for the Labour Party. The global financial crisis had made sure of it for our government, but I think we'd also lost connection with the people and some of our own members. It has been, as it is for most parties, a long, hard road back. But it does give you time to reflect on what really matters. My time in several economic portfolios led me to some pretty straightforward conclusions. New Zealand, as Grant knows, doesn't save enough. And what we do save, we invest in the wrong things. Without enough saving, investment's too costly and jobs are too few. KiwiSaver was a good start but it needs a boost, and the New Zealand Superannuation Fund must be made sustainable. We invest less than half of the OECD average in research and development, and yet that smart stuff is what's going to win us markets and give our kids access to the global jobs of the future. What capital we do have, we spend on the wrong things, like bidding each other's house prices up. I remember my horror when I found the first family in Kelston living in a garage. We got the dad a job, the kids are now at medical school. But tragically, you can't find many garages to park a car in these days in South Auckland. New Zealand has become a speculator's Pavlova paradise. No capital gains tax, negative gearing, weak rules on foreign land bankers, and throw in tax loopholes big enough to drive an apple through. It's time we put our policies where our principles are, not only because a fair go is right, but because the evidence is compelling. More equal societies do better economically too. In New Zealand, Inequality is actually holding us back. 
It is crippling our ability to do well as a country. The poor are getting poorer. The middle is working harder just to stand still. And with nearly all of the wealth created in the past decade attaching on average to the top 1%, a smaller and smaller share of national income is actually going to wage and salary earners. At some stage, hopefully soon, it has got to reach a tipping point. Mr Speaker, notwithstanding that, as the late great John Clark said, we don't know how lucky we are. I think he said Trev. <laughs> so this side of the House makes no apology for fighting inequality, investing in people and smarts, and celebrating all that is good in this beautiful, diverse and innovative country, and much of that, thank goodness, we all share. That was the message I hoped would resonate with many New Zealanders during my short time as Leader of the Opposition, including some of the missing million who couldn't be bothered to turn out to vote at all because they couldn't see the point anymore. I could write a book about the 2014 election campaign, but I don't think anyone would believe it or possibly read it. <laughs> but in any case, that campaign was one of the most bizarre the country has ever seen. We had Kim.com, Dong Ha Lu, and dirty politics coming out our ears. But what the Labour Party did not have enough of was time. Time to heal our old wounds. Time to raise the money. Time to build the systems to get our message through. Mike Moore once said that the easiest way to be wrong in politics is to be right too soon. And I have no regrets for standing up for what I believe in, though I recognise my delivery could at times have done with some work. <laughs> and no, family violence is still not OK. So it was a huge privilege to be able to lead the New Zealand Labour Party, and I'm indebted to all who were part of that campaign. I want to commend my successor, Andrew Little, and his deputy, Jacinda Ardern, and all my colleagues who are building now for the 2017 campaign that will give New Zealanders a real choice for a fresh start. Mr Speaker, progressive politics has been my passion for these last 18 years. But if politics is like malaria, a recurrent fever, I think I might be just about cured. <laughs> I've done what I can, and the time really has come to move on. I thank members for coming along to make sure I really mean it, but unlike David Longy, I'm not even going to joke about changing my mind. Because I am lucky enough, I mean this, to be able to change tax in my own time, in my own direction, and without a by-election, because Labor did so well in the last two, I just couldn't inflict another one on members opposite. <laughs> Line up, I'm going. <laughs> Mr Speaker, thank you for allowing the electorate officers of all our departing members to continue to serve needy constituencies, constituencies through these short months of interregnum. They say, this is unfair, that politicians are a mile wide and a millimetre deep. That may be the Bellamy's catering. I am, however, looking forward to returning to the private sector and getting stuck in to some deeper issues, consulting to businesses, iwi and regions. So, Mr Speaker, I am moving on with a real sense of optimism and excitement and, of course, a huge deal of gratitude. It is not possible, we all know this, to commit to a life in politics without the generous and self -support, selfless support of family and of friends. There are so many people to thank, it is impossible to do justice to them all. For some, I will convey privately the gratitude that time and place does not allow me to do today. To my long-standing electorate agents, Sue Hagen, and Lucy Schwenke, 
You've been with me through virtually the whole of my time in politics, and you've been there through the tough times. I could not have wished for better support or better friends. Thank you. My talented researcher, Chris Lau. My dedicated EAs, Rera Moana Fuli, Esther Robinson, David Hawkins, Paul Grant, Sue Piper, Gay Pledger, and others. To my former Labour Leaders Office staff, including Carl Beckett, Wendy Brandon, Rob Carr, Simon Cunliffe, Carolyn Dick, Rob Egan, Chris Harrington, Neil Jones, Matt McCartan, Deborah Manning, Elizabeth Munday, Dinah Oakby, Bronwyn Preson, and Bridget Service, and Clint Smith. Not forgetting in the Whips office, Emma Williams and Peter Hoare and my former ministerial staff, some of whom are in the gallery today. Thank you all so much for what you do for New Zealand and thank you for what we did together. To the Labour Party leadership, especially Presidents Nigel Howarth and Moira Coatsworth, General Secretaries Andrew Curtin and Tim Parnett, as well as the thousands of volunteers and members who give so selflessly to build a better New Zealand. To our affiliates in the union movement, especially my friends, the late Helen Kelly and the late Peter Conway. To Sam Huggard and Jill Ovens and friends here today, and to Richard Wagstaff, Angus McConnell, Chris Flatt, Joe Fleetwood, Bill Newsom, Robert Reid, and many others, kia kaha eho. To the incredible New Lynn Labour Electorate Committee, to Greg and Jan Presland, Claire Hargraves, Raymer Ingalls, James Armstrong, Aina Doyle and Val Graham, Kirsten H and what's his name? Don and Noreen Clark. There's a reason for that. <laughs> Val and Don Rogerson, Bruce and Trixie Harvey, David and Liz Craig, Dorothy and Alan McGray, Nisanka Kumarawansa, Ami and the late Savitri Chand, Susan Zhu, Vanessa King, Kay Jones, Martin and Loris Holland, and to my excellent intended successor for New Lynn, Dr Deborah Russell, and to socialist speechwriter, thank you all. To Helen Clark, Michael Cullen, Jonathan Hunt, Perry Keenan, Sir Bob and Lady Harvey, Richard and Jackie Randerson, Rick Boven, Richard Zeckhauser and Nitin Noria. Thank you all for your patience and guidance over the years. Thank you to the press gallery and the media for the important role that you continue to play. To all the parliamentary staff that keep us fed, watered and safe. We couldn't do it. New Zealand couldn't do it without you. Finally, to my family, who have given the most over so many years and especially to my two sons, William and Cameron, who are here today. I am so very proud of you guys. I love you very much, and I'm looking forward to spending more time with you when I get home. You guys face a world that is more complex and more challenging than that inherited by thus those baby boomers and us Gen Xers sitting in Parliament today. And while our world is changing in fundamental ways, the values that guide us should not, because they are ultimately what makes politics worth doing, not the roller coaster of media attention or the greasy pole of competition. This is ultimately a service job, and that is what, for me at least, has made it such a privilege to be part of. To all sides, all sides of this special house and all who serve it, I wish you all well. I look forward now to just being a voter and a constituent from now on. Haerera.
Members, the House is suspended for the dinner break. I shall resume the chair at 7.30.